And while we have our panelists brought up, uh, you're going to see some friendly and familiar faces. One of them is Dr. Daniel Belsky, who uh, you saw just a moment ago. Uh, you'll, he, he is also part of the biomarkers. Uh, I guess it's all Daniel Belsky all the time here. So we're <laughs> is what we're pr promising and doing. Uh, you will also, uh, Dr. Fernando Torres, who I had the great pleasure of interviewing today in a fireside chat earlier today. Of course, we have our very uh, esteemed moderator, Dr. Marie Bernard, who just this May, I think it's May of, of 2021 that you were appointed uh, by the NIH, the Chief Officer for Scientific Workforce Diversity. And uh, Dr. Linda Fried from Columbia University, who as a person of many parts, but among many of the things she does, she's taken over the, as Columbia did, the Center on Longevity that we talked about a few times, uh, originally founded by Dr. Butler. Uh, there's Dr. Torres. And uh, we're going to have a very particular kind of discussion today. The Catalis Institute uh, is certainly one that is looking for advances in geroscience to become part of public policy. That's our stated mission. There are two words right after that mission. And now I'm seeing Cynthia Stewart, Dr. Cynthia Stewart, uh, who I work with closely at the United Nations and Geo on Aging coming on. Um, but our mission, our stated mission is bringing geroscience into public policy and its advancements and its translation into material gains for all. And those two last little words, for all, is what this particular panel is about. Uh, we call it healthy longevity, uh, healthy health span equity. It's different than healthcare equity. Healthcare equity is talked about all the time. And that is getting the right doctors, the dental care, the eye care to everyone. And it's usually a matter of government entitlements and education. But a healthy longevity is brand new science. And I'm going to throw this over to Dr. Bernard as your moderator to see if we can really uh, bring new inroads into the concept of what equity may mean. Because as Thomas, uh, who is lurking in the background there, always likes to say, if all we do is get longer, healthier years for the wealthy, we have failed. And that's not what we want to do. So Dr. Bernard, take it away. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I am the new uh, NIH Chief Officer for Scientific Workforce Diversity, appointed uh, fully in this position in May, although I was acting in it since last October. Prior to that, I was an academic geriatrician and then the Deputy Director of the National Institute on Aging at the National Institutes of Health from 2008 until being appointed fully in this role. So this is an area that is of great interest um, to the National Institute on Aging, to the National Institutes of Health, and it's wonderful to have this uh, esteemed panel here. Talking with my, they call me the Coswood, with my Coswood hat on, but you know, informed as a geriatrician, um, there are some things that, that I think are important for health span and equity that we need to think about, um, and that, is uh, the issue of trust among populations. Um, making sure that the information that is being developed is uh, tailored and culturally appropriate, um, that any changes in health behavior that are being sought uh, to optimize health span are cognizant of the fact that people have differing backgrounds and beliefs and, and approaches to things. Um, and um, I think that will go a long way in helping with this issue with regards to health span. Um, I think each of us was going to talk about the most equitable way we can help people navigate a healthy longevity or health span system. So I'm going to now turn to Cynthia Stewart and see what initial thoughts you would like to share with the group. Well, thank you very much. And to, thank you to my esteemed panelists too. The United Nations Decade of Healthy Aging, which goes from 2021 to 2030, is a global collaboration aligned with the last 10 years of the Sustainable Development Goals that brings together government, civil society, international organizations, professionals, academe, the media, the private sector, to improve the lives of older people, their families, and the communities in which they live. 
As we know, populations around the world are aging at a faster pace than in the past, and the demographic transition will have an impact on almost all aspects of society. Already, there are over 1 billion people aged 60 or older, with most living in low and middle income countries. Many do not have access to even the basic resources necessary for a life of meaning and of dignity. Many others confront multiple barriers that prevent their full participation in society. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the seriousness of existing gaps in policy systems and services. A decade of concerted global action on healthy aging is urgently needed to ensure that older people can fulfill their potential with dignity, equality in a healthy environment. There are four sort of pillars, platforms of the decade. Just very briefly, the first is environments. Health and well-being, as we know, are not only determined by our, our genes and personal characteristics, but also by the physical and social environments in which we live our lives. Environments play a very important role in determining our physical and mental capacity across a person's life course and into old age, and also how well we adjust to the loss of function or other forms of adversity that we may experience at different stages of life, and particularly in later life. Both older people and the environments in which they live in the later years are also important that we recognize they must be dynamic and changing. They must be in interaction with each other, and they do hold an incredible potential for enabling or constraining a healthy aging. And just as Dan Belsky wrote, uh, was on the previous panel was speaking about that how important environments are and that can be to reinforce a healthy aging. The second pillar, very, it underlies everything, is ageism. Ageism affects how we think, feel, and act towards others and ourselves based on age. It imposes powerful barriers on the development of good policies and programs for older and younger people and has profound negative consequences on older people, our health and well-being. The World Health Organization is working together with key partners in its global campaign, campaign to combat ageism. We have to change the narrative around age and aging to help create a world for all ages. The third pillar, integrated care for older persons, which reflects a continuum of care that will help to reorient health and social services towards a more person-centered and coordinated model of care. Many health and community care workers need support on how best even to assess older people's health and effectively address their needs. The last pillar, integrated long-term care. Older people continue to have aspirations to well-being and respect, regardless of the declines in physical and mental capacity. Long-term care systems enable people who experience significant declines in capacity to receive the care and support that allow them to live in consistent in a life consistent with their basic rights, fundamental freedoms, and human dignity. These services can also help reduce the inappropriate use of acute health care services. They can help families avoid catastrophic care expenditures and free women, especially who are the main caregivers, to have broader social roles. While global data are needed on the need and unmet need for long-term care, the data do not exist. These four pillars, of course, are all interconnected, but go a long way to creating a healthier society for all ages. But we have to ensure that care for all ages is available and the focus is on healthy behaviors and lifestyles that support a long life 
a long, healthy life while recognizing the lifelong inequities of marginalized populations. The challenge, okay, here's the challenge. We've all been horrified by the treatment and high death toll due to COVID-19 on older persons. In the U.S. alone, nearly eight of 10 deaths were attributable to COVID-19. That's among the 65 and older in the U.S. The WHO estimates that one in six people have also experienced some form of abuse during the pandemic. And we also know that statistic is very underreported, especially for older persons. So I think the shortcoming is that there is no protection for the human rights of older persons. And I think it's time the U.S. especially needs to take leadership to support the drafting of a legally binding document for the protection of the human rights of older persons. If you want to learn more about that, I posted in the resources uh, information about why we need what we call a convention, a legally binding document on the rights of older, to promote the human rights of older persons. And also join us this Thursday from 12 to 1 for a Stand Up for Rights where we will focus specifically on the U.S. and Canada, but it is open to everyone. So um, I do hope we can all join together and use, make some good kind of come out of this global pandemic that really changes the course of history. Thank you. Thank you so much. And with the forbearance of my co-panelists, I'm going to revert to using first names. Um, so Linda, if you'd like to make an initial statement and perhaps try to address that very large question. Unmute. Good point. <laughs> um, the most cited statement of the year. Unmute. Uh, Marie, thank you. And I'm honored to be here with all of you. Uh, so many people in, on one screen who I have deep admiration for, um, starting with you, Marie. So uh, the question posed is huge. And uh, maybe what I can do is, is try and offer some remarks that uh, build on and hopefully extend and complement what Cynthia just said. Um, so if we try and ask the question about the most equitable way to, to navigate health span, I think that's the way it was phrased before. Uh, and there are a bunch of, there are several different frames I think we need to consider. One is that uh, I think we now see that it is possible to create a health span that matches uh, or approximates the length of our longer lives. We didn't know that 30 years ago, uh, but we do now know that. And we know that actually prevention works and matters across the whole life course, that the, the advantages of investing in health at every age and stage of life accrue over a life course, and that the people who are manifesting that ability to have a health span that, a, that is approximately as long as our longer lives are the people who have benefited from, have the access to and have benefited from all of those investments across their lives. Um, better resource populations with access to higher education, great public health, health producing environments, affordable um, affordability of, for the health behaviors that improve health and the right medical care. So we know it's possible that health is malleable. And I think the huge question is how to now target the resolution of the health disparities that are keeping everybody from having access to a, a health span, a, a, a much longer health span. That's a critical goal for individuals. It's a critical goal for societies. The return to, to at all levels it would be huge. And then the question is, I guess, how do we um, lay the groundwork for doing that? And um, certainly all the points that Cynthia made are critical, so I won't repeat them. I, I think that uh, another dimension is to really 
optimize two things. Certainly the advances of geroscience that could delay the process of aging and hopefully through that also slow or prevent the onset of multiple chronic diseases, which are, whose mechanisms are deeply tied to the aging process itself uh, would be a great advantage. But to raise the floor and the ceiling of health for everybody and make sure that that does not widen health disparities because only a subset of the population can experience them. We have to pair that with a, a next generation investment in a public health system that delivers health and prevents disease at every age and stage of the life course um, to everyone. Uh, to raise the floor and the ceiling of health. The US started disinvesting in its public health system in the 1960s. In our um, fascination with and buy in into advanced medical care. But we have left on the table the most powerful tool we have that, in addition to education, that creates 70% of any population's health. Our science has advanced so much that we need to partner the geroscience with the reinvestment in the conditions that create health. I'm, I'm leaving out the investments in human capital, on education, and in the social determinants of health, like housing, affordable housing, and, and issues of precarity, because I'm guessing um, that Dr. Torres Gill might, might help us with that. But these are. These are issues of a societal investment for a hundred year life so that people have the opportunity to live that with both health and dignity. But the last thing I'll say is that a, a huge part of healthy longevity is that if we create health span that approximates our longer lifespan, we have the opportunity to, as societies, to benefit from the unprecedented assets associated with getting older. Some of those may be financial because we have more time to save, but most of them are assets of the emotional, social, uh, cognitive and expertise assets that people accumulate, uh, develop over their lifetime, which are unprecedented. We've never had this wealth before. And, and this is a wealth underpinned as people get older by a desire to leave the world better than they found it, to the desire to give back, the desire to make sure that future generations do well. And we, if we create a longer health span for everyone, we have the social capital to actually deliver um, for people the ability to enact what they want to enact with all these assets and the ability for society to benefit from our longer lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Daniel, I heard on the last panel that you didn't get a chance to fully respond. So we'll, we'll go to you next so that you'll get a full chance to say what it is that you'd like to say. This first question, we'll hopefully get at least another round of questions after as well. Well, th thank you for the opportunity. I'll try to be very brief uh, and, and not take up too much of the time for the other panelists and, and our group discussion. Um, I'm also noticing that uh, Terry Moffat is not with us and, and I had thought that she would join us. So I'll try and maybe squeeze in her point as well so that doesn't get lost in the shuffle. Uh, I, I should first say that I don't uh, come to you today um, with answers. Uh, I, I think um, in contrast to you, many other panelists who've spent careers uh, learning what opportunities may exist for us to build health equity across the lifespan and uh, maybe envision today what we might call a health equity geroscience. Uh, I'm much more at the early stages of that journey. Um, and so what I can try and articulate for you are what I see as some of the research challenges we have to surmount on our way toward making effective investments in that health equity geroscience agenda or, or that uh, vision of health equity in aging for all. Um, I think the first thing that I wanna know um, as we consider how to make those strategic public health investments in aging health equity um, is what is the magnitude of impact of simple 
economic resources in people's lives. Too many of our citizens face too many challenges in investing in their own healthy aging uh, because they simply don't have those economic resources. And although we have a range of different programs that are designed to backstop resources that individual families have, those programs are difficult to access, complicated to operate, and offer ultimately too few resources to truly enable individuals to take control of their own health, destiny, and aging. Um, and so as we consider uh, programs at different scales and complexities to invest in those healthy lives for individuals, uh, I think we need to consider devising trials that can test the impact of very simple economic resource investments in the lives of individuals. Um, and the, the work that I do around uh, developing instruments to measure processes of aging within people's bodies uh, in scales of years, rather than the kinds of scales of decades we need to find out whether we're actually preventing disease or preserving healthy lifespan, uh, may make possible evaluations of interventions where we're simply writing checks to people or potentially making more structured investments of resources in people's lives. But that I think is, is the first investment I'd like to see in terms of uh, knowledge development uh, in guiding investments toward healthy aging. Um, I'm gonna leave to you, Dr. Bernard, the, the discussion of who it is that we enroll in trials of our therapies. That's something that I know you uh, have been a powerful advocate for and I think is absolutely critical. Um, but I will, Try to bring forward a point that, that Terry Moffat brought up in our trial session as we prepared for this conversation um, about the need to include in our studies of aging processes younger participants. Um, and younger people are of interest to those of us studying biological aging because increasingly we understand that the biological processes that drive morbidity disability and mortality um, are, are in progress really from the very earliest stages of life and accumulate across a period of lifespan in, in young adulthood when we might consider people to be in peak health. So uh, including those kinds of individuals in our studies of aging is critical for observing the early development of the diseases uh, that will ultimately disable and kill us, uh, but also because many of the individuals in our population won't live to the ages at which we typically enroll individuals in studies of aging. So uh, if we think about aging as a health problem for those 70 and above, well, almost half the population doesn't even get there. Uh, and so it's in investing in research into aging processes and younger people um, that, that we can begin to uh, address that, that disparity and, and build toward uh, this aging health equity model. Um, I think finally, uh, I'll, I'll conclude with a note about the need to focus our efforts to develop measurements of aging processes, and this is where my work in particular has spent a lot of its time over the last few years, um, in populations that extend beyond those that are most readily available to us as biomedical researchers. And here, I suppose, Dr. Bernard, I am treading a little bit on your ground. Um, so why don't I, I stop myself and uh, I'll yield back the time and, and maybe we can pursue this further as, um, as we go on. Thank you very much. You need not worry about treading on my territory. We all share it, but we'll get to that in the discussion period. Fernando. Hello, everyone. Thank you for including me in this uh, very important panel. And uh, let me first commend all of you for bringing forth some critical concepts, whether it's uh, healthy lifespan, longevity. I love this term, a healthy, a health equity general science. Thank you, Daniel, for that. Or whether we're trying to promote a health span as we look at longevity. Uh, I want to commend you all because this is not just important in terms of the aging process, whether it's physiological or biological, but certainly it's going to be important for a society, this country, that is not only aging, but becoming more diverse. And um, I approach this, by the way, in a personal way, as a 73-year-old Latino that's been aging with a disability. So that gives me kind of uh, a context or a perspective within which I try to grapple with this. But also professionally, and I'm a professor, not a physician or, or a doctor or anything like that. Uh, I also 
approach it from my career, which had been primarily about gerontology and the issues of those that reach a certain age, 65 and over. And also as an advocate, going all the way back to Maggie Kuhn and Bob Butler and Carol Estes and many others that supported and promoted programs, public programs based on age. If you can make it to age 60 or age 65 or even age 50 for AARP, then you would get attention because you've reached that. Uh, but I am now shifting gears towards one that is closer to what I believe you're promoting with this important event. And that's beginning to look at the entire life course, beginning to look at issues from both a health span, but also an equity lens, and beginning to try to bring in the intergenerational aspects. And most importantly, what I hope will be the inter-ethnic, interracial aspects. Uh, if I go back to uh, my own personal observations at this stage in life, I am now more concerned, not with do we have sufficient caregiving or home and community-based long-term care services for patients with Alzheimer's, which is really crucial. I am more concerned now with what I see on the streets, in the community, here in Los Angeles, but it's across the country, if you go to any black or brown community or Native American community or low income community, you'll see young people, K through 12, that are already facing issues of obesity and diabetes, that are already facing a set of chronic conditions that over time will cause them to have very difficult health circumstances as they grow older. And again, I think Daniel, you pointed out something very important. They may not even live long enough to be part of our aging studies, to be part of that sample. Here in California, uh, we've been working closely on what we call our master plan on aging. And we've really pushed two or three concepts to begin to think through how we prepare for an aging and diverse society. One, certainly an equity lens we now have to address the growing diversity within society. The other, a longevity lens, it's no longer about what we do for older persons. And another, the disability lens. All of us will face some level of disability. But increasingly, without saying that I'm moving away from gerontology, I am more and more focused on issues of younger populations, precisely because I want them to have a longer lifespan and one that would benefit from the great things that you are all doing. And I'll leave you with one practical aspect that we've been promoting. Uh, most of our K through 12 public education systems in California are now majority black, brown, Asian, Pacific Islander. That I think is a population where we need to begin to inject gerontology, longevity, healthy lifespan in the K through 12 curriculum, especially among middle school students and high school students. If we don't capture their attention at that point, or at least socialize them to begin to think that these things matter, then I really worry that as the US becomes majority minority and the 2020 census makes it very clear by 2030, it's a majority minority society, we're gonna have next generations of older persons, the ones that are now millennials, Gen X, Gen Z, who will be essentially ethnic racial minorities in very difficult health circumstances with all the consequences. So this is all to say, how can we find ways now to bring to the agenda of these emerging ethnic racial populations that are especially younger as cohorts, the lessons and the concepts that we have here. At this stage in my life, I'm making that one of my priorities, beginning to, as I say, gerontologize and influence younger cohorts for the very important concepts you have here in this panel. Thank you so much, Marie. Uh, you certainly have been thinking a great deal about this. And I will uh, uh, talk a little bit about what Terry said to me, and she was going to be on this panel, and it was a family matter that kept her away. And I will tell you that if we have been able to solve what we're talking about now, she'd be on the panel now. <laughs> because family issues really do involve the fact that we are all responsible, if you're lucky, for older adults. And, and they, have, they, do, they definitely have issues. 
but um, we'll talk a little bit about what she had to say to me later. Maria, I know you have so much to add to all of this. You know, I really um, started off with my issue with regards to the importance of having uh, trust in populations, because what we're talking about here is something that's really complex. We're talking all the way from the molecular, cellular level, what's been discovered with regards to things that can impact health span and lifespan to the individual, to the community, to all of society across the globe. Um, and the way that this will impact any particular individual within those various systems is going to vary based upon their environmental exposures, their genetic background, um, their um, social uh, interactions and opportunities or lack thereof. So when we talk in terms of equity, it's a very complex consideration. What's What allows for um, a, an equitable arrangement for one individual may be very different from the equitable arrangement for another individual. Now, much of what we've talked about is this issue of uh, potentially uh, what we call social determinants of health, things that can potentially be modified with appropriate outreach and support, um, but that has to be very clearly tailored. Um, and, you know, I really would like to turn it back to someone like you, Adrian, as a real expert in dealing with the lay public, uh, to hear what your thoughts are as to how we get all of this complex information out to the lay public so that it can be utilized in a, a reasonable fashion. And I really want to know what the other panelists think, given how complex this is, what are the top two or three things that we could do now to make a difference? Because it's very complex system from my viewpoint. I mean, Adrian, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I'm going to say two things. One from personal experience. Uh, I'm not a doctor. I'm a lawyer, but don't hold that against me. The fact is that I've been a lawyer for many, many years, over 51 years. And in one of my capacities, I was the head of a, one of the New York State Bar Association committees. Now, New York State runs from New York City all the way to the border with Canada, where most of the people there are farmers. And so when you uh, take over a committee that's statewide, you really have a lot of constituents and they're very, very different. So what we learned was that you had to message differently because the information we were getting to the people, uh, even the attorneys were taking their messages very differently. And we were getting information about elder care because it was a committee of elder law attorneys, one of the first in the world, I think. So first, number one, talk to the people. Being in, um, in radio for many years in television, and television, you're taught to uh, focus on one person as if you're talking to one person. Well, you can't do that here. You have to know exactly who you're talking to and know that you're talking to many people with many different messages. So we do have to listen before we talk. How are people receiving their messages about many things that's working? Just like we had with Dan Belsky, uh, Monique Sternin's concept of the positive deviant. What is working in these different communities to get our messages across? And the second thing I will say, and then get off the stage here, is as a lawyer, I think that we have to talk in terms of rights. Uh, for the preparation of this panel and the conference, I did speak to Black Health Matters, a variety of different Asian organizations, community organizations, uh, and uh, you can probably mention almost any kind. I live in California. We just had Native American Day. It was one of the most thrilling things in the world, but I will tell you that there are many kinds of Native Americans and there are many kinds of tribal cultures. So even within what we would think is a subculture, there are many subcultures. Right? So we have to talk that way and we have to go to all of these community advocates and explain to them that healthy longevity is a right. Americans like rights and they understand that message. And when they see healthy longevity, in addition to health care, which we can all and have talked about as a right, this could change the narrative of what Communities are demanding of us on a national level and a local level, but without education about the difference between health span, longevity, and health care, it will not be seen as a right and understood as a right. And it's a right that has to start almost at birth and almost with what we teach 
people in the community about health care of their infants and then go on from there. So I think it's a matter of messaging. And I think it's a matter of many messages, all of them saying the same things, but in the right way so that they're received. And that's the beginning of the demands that will come not a trickle down, but a trickle up. When everybody expects it, wants it, and understands it, they can put the demands on the system that can deliver it for them. So I think we're at ground zero here, but, uh, and we have a huge ways to go, and, but it can be done. And it can be done with the right words. And next year, I wanna bring the Ed Council in because they have power in terms of what, how they can message and how they get messages across on social media, through apps, and on television, if that still exists, if anybody watches TV anymore, whether everybody's watching it on their other devices. But yeah, we need, we need that, and we need to um, social media out our messages. Because that, that is a common denominator in this country. Almost every single group does use the internet or their cell phone and has that kind of access. That's not true as Cynthia knows in other countries, but, but it is true here. So that's my piece of it. Thank you. So going back to the other panelists, um, make this easy for us. It's not easy, but what are the top two or three things that you would like to see happen now that truly is, are feasible that would help to achieve equity and health span for all? Anyone want to jump in and volunteer or shall I call on people? Okay, Fernando. Well, I'll just, uh, I'm gonna, I'd like to build on Adrian's uh, comments about listening and learning from other. And uh, again, if, if I can continue to build on the growing diversity of this country and the 2020 census made very clear that where the directions that we're going, you know, as we begin to at least ask the question, how do we respond to the needs of different ethnic racial groups as, they, as we hope they'll be able to benefit from our concepts of healthy aging, et cetera, et cetera. We also need to learn from them and not superimpose what we as gerontologists think are the answers to how you age. And I'll give just two, three examples. Uh, first of all, uh, may I call you, Maria, I'm a co-PI of an NIA grant on aging in the Americas. We're working with our Mexican counterparts and, uh, and with immigrants and migrants that are going back and forth transnationally between the US and Mexico. And there's at least two or three things that we're learning that are tremendous strength within these communities, regardless of their immigration status, socioeconomic status. Status. First of all, resiliency, resiliency. Um, it's quite prevalent among Latino and first generation uh, groups, uh, including the African-American community and Asian Pacific Islander communities. How do we, continue to draw on that. It helps them to overcome adversity. And that leads, at least for the Latino community, what we call the Hispanic paradox, which is now very well documented that first generation Mexican, Central American immigrants, for whatever reason, despite all the terrible things they go through, seem to have better health care and mental health outcomes than their native born, um, native born populations. And then the third, is that the intergenerational aspect. These groups continue to support and connect with each other based on families, whether it's elder, middle age, or young. So there are some real strengths, inherent strengths in these ethnic cultural groups. However, we also know from the Hispanic paradox that some groups begin to lose it by the time they get to second, third generation by becoming acculturated, or as we like to say with kind of in a tacky way, they become Americanized and start doing all the bad things that lead to unhealthy aging in this country. So as we look to applying these concepts from this panel towards the growing diversity of the country, let's listen and understand what are the strengths of these ethnic racial groups, especially first generation immigrants. How do we maintain and support them so that they don't lose it and become too much like us, which has led to all these other unhealthy behaviors. Really well taken points. Uh, who would like to build on that or give me that answer to what's easy? <laughs> Adrian? Well, I was gonna actually call on Dan. Uh, Terry did say that one of the things that we don't wanna miss here is the rural community. 
that when we talk about ethnicity, we talk about systemic racism, we talk about color, uh, we forget that people also have uh, uh, underserved populations just because they're in rural areas, regardless of their race, regardless of even sometimes economic levels. So she wanted to make sure that when we talked about for all, we really meant it for all, and that we sometimes forget that particular population. But I'm going to throw that uh, to Daniel because Daniel and Terry also worked together and you had a few words that you wanted to say that she was going to uh, discuss. So I, I think really the main idea that Terry had shared in our meeting that I wanted to make sure that we included was the need to study younger people uh, to understand the where disparities in healthy aging come from. Um, and, and I think I, I did have a chance to give some voice to that. Um, I think that to the prompt of what is easy that we know how to do now, that is feasible, that can change disparities in aging across the, the country or the world, I, that's a pretty tall order. Uh, and I don't think I have a pat answer to that one. I mean, what I can say is that we know that making people's lives better helps them age in healthier ways. And we know lots of ways that we can make people's lives better. So the real question comes down to this, this final criterion of feasibility. And what is feasible, uh, you know, what is within our grasp as the wealthiest country on the planet, uh, and what is feasible within our country and its incredibly divided politics are, um, you know, not the same thing. Uh, so um, while I think it's feasible to transform aging for all people in our society, at least within this country today, uh, you know, it's within our grasp. Uh, we're unable to put our hands around it because of political challenges we face in, in mobilizing the will to action. Um, I think that there are investments that we can make in public health today that make it safer and easier for more people uh, to eat healthier food and to move more than we do now. Uh, but those are big public policies uh, and, and they're really not something that, that can be enacted uh, easily in any setting. Um, we're seeing that the pandemic made an opera, made, you know, created opportunities to send money to families, um, which is happening now uh, in, in a non-means tested way, in fact, which is sort of astonishing. Um, and, and we may ultimately be able to determine the impact of that kind of direct investment uh, on the health of our population and on its trajectory of aging. Um, I'd like to see more of that. Again, that seems feasible. No child should have to grow up poor in this country. Is it feasible to end that now? I don't think so. Uh, not, not within the, the politics that, that we live in today. So I, I um, that, that's a long no, I think. Is, long you're getting well, <laughs> you, you know, one of the things I've learned as a non-scientist is that the biology of aging can be very much affected by devices, like my watch, where I can measure a lot about my own body. And more and more of these great devices are coming out could also be changed by metformin and rapamycin possibly and other actual drugs, pills. It could also be changed by your own behaviors as we had in the behavior panel. And those are probably the three big ways, measuring, uh, having uh, additives, and I'm gonna call all kinds of drugs, nutraceuticals, whether they're regulated or not regulated, Marie, as an additive and our own behaviors. So this is what we know. And if we want equity for all, we have to look at all the ways that people can live longer, healthier and perhaps have different ways of bringing that to all underserved populations. And again, I don't think it is a big leap to say that we need to listen. We need to go to the advocacy groups, whether it's the churches, which are often left out, uh, because Marie says, who do you trust? And she actually told me that uh, one uh, group that is trusted is the frontline doctors. Uh, and this is also true of certain other healthcare workers. They have to be convinced and educated on the message of longevity, healthy longevity, not just health care, not just sick care, which is where they are educated. And uh, when they can bring the message to different groups that trust them, that will make a huge difference. 
And then I think last, and this is, I'm gonna throw over to, to Linda, who knows a lot about this, it saves money. And if we can do a study, an economic study, group by group, showing, let's say, if we eradicated childhood diabetes, what that would save, how much money could then go into our school systems instead? We might make a dent on the politicians and the policymakers. So we have to attack this in many, many fronts. And I think, Linda, you've been doing a lot of thinking about this. Of uh, uh, so many groups that you you do work with and rely on you for, for their thinking, what would you say to some of these things? Well, if we're talking about what can we do now, um, you know, I, I'm not sure that the Gero Science, for example, which has huge promise, is ready to be. Used. It's not ready to be used now. So, I, 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 if I were to look at what we can do now to set us on a course for healthy longevity. Um, I mean, there's a long list, but I'll pitch three things. One is um, we, we need to learn how to do what you were talking about, Adrian. We need to, this is a research agenda, but we need to learn how to communicate so that people understand the, op uh, the potential optimism of having longer lives and the need to, for both society and individuals to invest in it turning out well. And the good news is that those investments mean people do better in the moment as well as in the future. But we need to learn how to talk about that and to also have people understand that a lot of health we have to create together. It's not just an issue of an individual behavior um, that somebody can do autonomously. We have to create the conditions as Dan was saying, which people can do it. And because it, I'm sorry, because it does take a long time, uh, I would like to start now just in the narrative, even if it's just in the narrative. So we need a new narrative that all of, not all of our systems were designed when life expectancy is, was half of what it is now and less than half of what it will be in 20 years. Uh, they are not designed for a longer life. They're not designed for anybody to experience really the benefits of a longer life, which are many. So we need a new narrative. The, the second thing I would do now is to capture the moment of our disaffection with our current public health system in the face of COVID and recognize that the US has disinvested in that system for, since 1960 and we're reaping the consequences of that. And we need a new public health system, not trashing the other one, but reinvesting and redesigning it based on the science of what we now know about the possibilities of creating long lives with health and, and design a public health system that's adequately resourced so we can deliver health in every community. And then the third thing I would do, and, and that's the way to invest in preventing those kids from getting diabetes and, uh, and obesity in the opposite order. That's so it has to be, part of that has to be how we educate our kids in our school systems. Um, but, but that is an investment we should be making as a country and what the science already tells us how to do. And then the third thing I would do to complement and strengthen that. So the next generation of older adults are healthier than right now they're, gonna, they're being predicted to be. It, and the other thing I would do is a national call to action for every older adult in this country to stand up and contribute to the success of a child, um, to create a social, new social convoy system uh, that matches older adults as coaches with, with children to support their success over the coming years. And that will also create an optimism about aging and the kind of partner that every young person needs in a trusted older person who's not in their family. You know, um, the reason I'm the executive director here and I'm not a scientist is when they conceived of this nonprofit, I said, okay, you'll make everybody live longer. What are we gonna do with our time? Mm -hmm. Well, Linda Free just told you what we could do with our time. We could be mentors to the younger generation and, and it, it, it's tearful, it's beautiful. 
But you know what isn't so beautiful? We spend 18% of our GNP, the most in the world, on healthcare, and we're less than half, less than 50% our healthy longevity than other countries. We are so far behind. And I, I do, I, I saw Cynthia wants to say a word about this, but I, I have to ask Marie something. Uh, the workforce, I mean, your work right now has to do with diversity in the scientific workforce, basically, in research. What about that? Do you think that we're overlooking um, equality, systemic racism and systemic other inequalities in the workforce that if we looked at that as one part of this big picture, we might do better in terms of healthy longevity for all? No question. Um, the whole reason that there is a chief officer for scientific workforce diversity at NIH is that NIH recognized that we could do much better in terms of enhancing the diversity of the people who are generating the science. And there's a lot of information with the business setting, uh, growing information in the scientific setting that demonstrates that when you have those diverse perspectives, you have greater creativity, greater innovation, better science. And you know, if only based upon the census data that Fernando was talking about, where we see that we're having more and more in the younger generations, individuals from what's traditionally been considered underrepresented racial and ethnic groups, if you don't have full representation uh, among the scientific community of those populations, they've generally been very underrepresented in the sciences, you're, you're missing out on potential talent. Um, so yes, uh, we recognize that this is important. Uh, we also recently launched um, in February uh, an initiative to end structural racism uh, after spending uh, many months uh, from the end of May of 2020 through till the public unveiling in February, internal unveiling in October of 2020, thinking about what it is that we need to do. Because when you look at the data, um, there are things structurally, systematically in the biomedical uh, uh, environment that lead to lack of equity. What do I mean by that? That you can look at a person's demographics and predict the likelihood that they're gonna be successful, for instance, in getting an R1 grant from NIH, which is the brass ring. How does that translate into other things? You know, it translates not only into the creativity and innovation that's brought to various scientific questions, it translates into who gets recruited into scientific studies with lots of data showing that when you have a diverse team um, that's doing the recruiting, you're going to have diverse participants within the trial. And that allows the clinical study to find um, answers that are applicable to the full uh, community of folks within the U.S. Usually, if that's the study that we're looking at. Um, so it's important in lots of different ways. Um, and there's a lot of work yet to be done. And thus, the position that I have uh, that's been in place since 2014 and the NIH Unite Initiative. Fascinating because if we can't assure healthy longevity because we aren't doing the science for the diverse populations, that's a problem in itself. Uh, and, but I think Cynthia, did you uh, kind of had your hand up? Yes, I was um, certainly support all the suggestions that have been made by, by fellow panelists. But I also wanna say, come back to, I think this horrible pandemic does provide this opportunity. And I, I hear it really coming out and think about who were some of the first people to come out of retirement and, and staff the hospitals with desperately ill COVID patients, but retired physicians, retired nurses, retired health healthcare personnel, and especially in rural areas, you know, took it upon themselves. And that goes back to everybody wants to make it better. But also remember in the very early days of the pandemic, when people thought, oh, you know, there are only older people dying from it. Well, maybe we'll, you know, there were actually legislators in the US who said, well, I don't think we should deal with anybody over 70, right? Well, that leaves Fernando and me out, right? So I, seriously, I think we have to, and I would be also very much in favor in getting the Ad Council very involved. We used it very successfully to help dispel myths about age-related eye disorders uh, among older persons when I worked at Lighthouse. And we had a very successful campaign called Size Matters. Well, it caught on 
And it wasn't an embarrassment to enlarge print. It wasn't an embarrassment to say, I can't. Can anyone really read the Medicare forms? The print legibility is a disaster. So, you know, things like that can make a tremendous difference. And I also concur, intergenerationally, it's where we have to begin. And it begins with the pregnant mother getting adequate child care, uh, prenatal care, and then adequate child care. And it goes all the way through to vaccines for life and talk about the need we all have to talk to the anti-vaxxers in our, in our country. You gotta sit down and listen to their perspective, but you gotta reach them in a new way to say, this is important and a responsibility we have for future generations. We've gotta find the way, and maybe the words we as professionals in this field are using isn't the right way. Isn't working. So therefore, that's where we need their help in the terms of messaging. So, so I want to throw this over to Fernando for a moment. Uh, in our Behavior One panel with Monique Sternin, uh, the idea of being a positive deviant was she founded this concept for social change. But the key to her, and it was very clear, is you find what the community is doing and you find what the community is, is feeling and you get the community to be peer to peer to each other. My question to you, Dr. Torres, it's the same question I had before because it's, it's, a, it's a big one, is what do we do on the national, state, and local level? I asked you to choose between the two and you refused. You said, no, we, we could do it all. We have to do it on all levels. I'm still fascinated by the potential. We have like about four minutes of interacting on all of those levels to reach all of the people that those levels reach from the political or policy side of things. We've talked a lot about the con commercial side of it and the nonprofit side of it, and even the education side of it. But what do we bring to Washington or state government or local government with regard to this? One practical policy approach that, that I think will really get to a quick positive benefit for younger and diverse population, support the national efforts to uh, create an affordable daycare pre-K program for all families. So that alone to give all families and kids that childcare and daycare and pre-K will go a long way because it will also include exercise and nutrition go a long way. The second part, expand the, Obama, expand the Affordable Care Act to all those states that refuse to accept it, which tend to be a lot of the red states where you have a lot, the largest promote the largest proportion of low income minority communities. So affordable daycare, expanding the Affordable Care Act where it's not there. And then lastly, and this gets to uh, Cynthia's uh, uh, point here about intergenerational, one of the great areas that we're concerned about, of course, is caregiving and trying to expand home and community-based long-term care services. And I'm always amazed at the large number of persons that are dependent on long-term care workers, especially upper income, non-Hispanic white persons who are dependent on essentially immigrant minority, low-income females for their caregiving. So it'd be nice to have an intergenerational political coalition where those that can afford home care and long-term care and rely on immigrants and diverse populations of their caregivers can come together and realize that they have a mutual interest and supporting state and national programs that will finally give us a whole continuum of home and community-based long-term care. Thomas, who's preparing for our networking session, uh, likes to say that if we can move the money, if we can simply live longer, healthier, we'll save so much money. Well, a lot of that money will come from the cost of caregiving to older adults, to childcare for younger adults. Imagine, can you imagine all those millions and billions of not only dollars, but energy and time, not necessary for the older adult expenditure bring, being brought to education or children, right? So that would be in and of itself would move the needle. Just uh, the fact that the average home caregiver is female and 46 years old. That means they can't work or they can, cannot work full time or they can't completely 
uh, enjoy the careers they could have. And that really hurts the economy. So what we're doing here can move the needle so, in so many ways, and I'm just trying to be ready for it. In the minute we have left, I'm gonna throw that over to, to Marie because she has been so generous with her time. Uh, and to kind of wrap up a little bit about what she feels she heard and what she could take back to the NIH. Maybe we'll get some one of those R1 grants. So, um, and yes. Yes. My um, new role at NIH is very specifically leading thought about scientific workforce diversity. But what I heard very clearly is that there is a lot of workforce to do. There are a lot of things that are truly feasible if we have the uh, true motivation, grit, and willingness to pursue things that we need to be thinking very expansively that, you know, this process of having a health health span that matches uh, lifespan begins very early in life. Um, and that we need to think of it not just as an entity within the United States, but as a global community. So it's really exciting um, to be able to be on this panel with these real experts in the field who are leading the thought. Um, and I really hope that uh, some of the things that have been mentioned as being feasible uh, immediately, uh, including the issues with regards to messaging, Adrian, will really will get started and that when you meet next year, you'll be able to do a recap and talk about all of the wonderful things that have happened in that direction. Well, that's wonderful. And I'm thanking you so much. And, and Linda, uh, you did so much great work in the field already and your thinking is, is so clear. And I said the same to, to Dr. Torres because one of the problems we have is sometimes the thinking in this field is so new, it's so new that it gets just to be rhetoric. And that's why we're, we're looking for real solutions. And this is going to be the beginning of it. There's a thousand people uh, who have registered for this and many, many hundreds of attendees on each one of these panels. And I'm gonna ask them all to stay participatory because tomorrow we're gonna to tell everybody about a campus, an online campus that the Catalyst Institute has created for ongoing continuation of this dialogue. And I think it's really important to break these silos, bring everybody together, academia and science and policymakers and the public all together in a place where everybody could, could talk to each other. Uh, and that's the networking session that's coming up next. So everybody has to actually get off this because this is a special webcast Zoom and then get on the uh, next uh, Zoom meeting for our networking session. All of you if, you, if you're wondering, how do I do that? Just go to your email. You've just gotten an email with a link to be able to get onto the networking session. Also a poll that we ask at end of day and with regard to that poll, you get points because we've gamified this. We, we're, we're coming into the 21st century. And what do you win? Books. Probably there's nobody uh, whose book is not in our bookstore. So if you want to know what you're going to win, again, you can go on your platform. If you're logged in, go to the bookstore, you'll see what everybody wrote and you're uh, eligible to win some of that. So I thank you so much. It's been an incredibly glorious day and uh, enjoy it. Uh, now we have to get off, and I think I stay up promoted. Um, last time I was promoted was 1965, but enjoy, enjoy yourselves, and thank you so much.